weekly fan request roulette here on Answer Everywhere. This is a live show where I pick at random one of the requests that one of my uh, viewers has, has suggested. And we take a look at the source code for some open source project and try to peer into its soul and see what makes it work. I've already done some pre-work. As usual, I've got my um, as usual, I've got the Bitcoin price, uh, my access to the, the standard Taylor Swift tweets has been denied. Um, so I've switched uh, as last time to the NIST randomness beacon. And then I produce a list that's going to give us a top 20 of the requests. And, uh, I guess I'll read these out this time. Um, we have TCC view free RTOS X or Wayland, my sequel core utils. Apache Spark, Open Foam, Redux, Ghidra, I guess it's pronounced, the, the reverse engineering thingy-majig, Flipper Zero, NFS, Lazy Git or Lazy Docker, Gnome Shell, Bitcoin, something about data intensive applications, C groups, which is the essentially the technology behind uh, containers, Node.js, Dart, and, and GNU mock and or GNU herd. So <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting a message that the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name, the prime Agian, prime again, and I are streaming at the same time. You can only watch one. Well, I guess, I don't know. I guess you have to choose. Um, his streams might be more entertaining. Mine might be more informative. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry to force you to choose. But that that's uh that happens sometimes. Okay. So, let's go ahead and do our usual of rolling a d20. All right, 6. What is 6? Six? 6 is core utils. Now, I don't know who requested core utils. I just know that it was requested. I think um, it's lost to uh, lost the time he requested. If you are the one who requested core utils, let me know. And I will um, I will credit you. Okay. Let's find core utils. Are the basic file, shell, and text manipulation utilities of the GNU operating system. They are the core utilities which are expected to exist on every operating system. So in theory, if you have any sort of Linux or GNU, uh, whatever, GNU herd, you should have core utils. Uh, here's the source code. This is going to be essentially some version of Git web, right? Or CGit. Let's go to GitHub. GitHub, by the way, has significantly improved its search. I don't know if um, if they were inspired by source graph, but the search looks a little bit more source graphy now. For example, as this repo keyword here, which it did not used to have, and which source graph had. So I don't know if you're familiar with source graph or you work on source graph. Let me know if they uh, they stole some of your flavor. Okay, so let's clone the core utils. I have a feeling. That might be a useful activity. I seem to have closed my terminal. This seems big. And let's generate tags for it just for fun. All right, so I'm not actually so certain what's even in core utils or why you would want them. But let's find out what's in it. It should be a bunch of stuff we know and love, and then probably also a bunch of stuff that uh, you might only know if you're a wizard, which I am not, I don't think. They rewrote their search in Rust. I was unaware of this. Uh, I'll have to read more about that. Is that. Do they have like a blog post about it? We get thanks, and thanks TT. And 
mostly, this is a little bit surprising, but there's no giant collection of C files in the main directory, which is what I've sort of come to expect from um, older projects and uh, new projects in particular. I see they have some Perl. I'm guessing Perl is mainly for things like tests, a tiny amount of C++, only 2% of C++, and about 60% of it is C. And then there's a, almost a quarter of it is shell, which is, who knows? There's scripts is probably where the shell uh, happens. Here's source. I'm going to guess source is the main place to be, although lib could be a contender. And then gl and gnu lib. gl might mean gnu lib. I don't know. Let's see what gl is. We have lib modules and tests. And things like buffer, CL start, uh, string to decibel maybe, F advise, heap. These look like um, some of this stuff is standard stuff I recognize, like string to whatever that was. Smack. We might have run into Smack before. Let's see what Smack is. If you have Smack, Common Smack functions used by core utils. Let's see what GNU Smack is. Yeah, okay, I remember this. Simplified Mandatory Access Control Kernel. It's a kernel security module, I guess, similar to um, uh, App Armor, or I forget what the NSA one is called. Something Linux. Okay, uh, so that this might be useful might not be useful. Let's see what's in source. Source is Blake, which is, I think, the encryption algorithm. And a bunch of files, each one uh, corresponding to the name of a utility that I mostly recognize. I've heard that yes is actually somewhat interesting. Um, so let's look at yes. But before we do that, let's look at lib. Lib just has two things. And none of them seem to have especially interesting names. So we're going to skip them. And then scripts. I have things like Git hooks. So that seems like kind of meta repository info. And then in source, is that where we just were? Source is the thing that has yes, right? Okay. Awesome. And I think that's that's mainly that's mainly it, right? Let's ask um Bard. Bard was just updated. What are hey, what? How about what are some of the highlights of the new core utils source code repo? See if Bart has anything useful to say. Now let's ask the same question to ChatGPT. Okay, so I'm going to start with yes because it's extremely simple. So if you're not familiar, yes um, emits Ys indefinitely forever. Um, I guess you can pipe things into it to accept prompts or something. I'm not sure, um, if it has any other, <laughs> any other SE Linux, I think is the thing I was trying to think of. I'm not sure if yes has any other use. Should we look at it? Let's look at the SE Linux header just for fun. Um, shred, GNU shred is interesting. That's the utility that should, um, I'm, I don't know what the implementation details are, but it, um, does something kind of equivalent to like overwrite, you know, if you want to shred a file it overwrites it with nonsense so that when you delete it, there's no um, trace of it on your hard drive. Like, I don't know if I have shred, do I have shred? Yeah, so I could do echo my secret stuff with the secret.txt and then shred secret.txt and then what will happen? It's uh, overwritten with essentially random data. So that's shred. Did we open shred? Yeah. Cool. What else do we want? Shuff is probably shuffling. Sleep. I'm sure we've all used sleep at some time. Sort, I'm gonna guess is sort, but I don't I'm not sure off the top of my head which sort. Maybe quick sort. Split stat. I guess let's look at stat. Mm, S T T Y, possibly. Sync. I guess it's like a sync system. I don't know what TAC is. 
Let's take a quick look at TAC. TAC concatenate and print files in reverse. Oh, it's the um, reverse of cat. Yeah, let's look at TAC. That should be simple. And if it's not simple, then there's probably an interesting reason why it's not simple. And definitely let's look at LS. And uh, some of the file stuff, I guess. Um, these are all like standard file utilities that I think that um, everyone is is has used. I forget how paste works. I know I've used it before. Real path, is that interesting? Maybe not. Let's look at remove and remove dir. Sort, split, sum. Do I have sum? I'm not sure what sum is supposed to do. Is it just adding numbers? Man sum. Check sum and count the blocks of the file. Okay, so it's a check sum. That is possibly interesting, but we're not going to, I'm going to ignore it. Um, okay, tail. Yeah, I'll do T and I'll do tail. Should I do test maybe? And TR. I'm not sure how many of these we'll really get to. We might start, um, I might start uh, deciding that everything kind of looks similar after a while. Once we get a sense of like how, how things are implemented. Head, group, fold. And if folks are watching this, uh, let me know if there's any of these files that you especially want to see. All right. Um, echo du, I guess let's do du and whoops, I'm going to do cut. And then there's core utils.c, which I'm guessing is like an entry point. Chone, yeah, let's do ch root and chone and chmod and cat. I think we want cat more at the beginning. Can I send this to the, uh, let me just pull it out. Okay. So let's, let's, uh, we have a queue. Let's begin processing the queue. And I'll put cat after, and I guess I'll ignore everything in lib. We've got heap in the lib. I'm going to guess it's for programmers of core utils. Okay. Here's yes. So yes should be really simple. How many lines of code do we have? Oh no. The new GitHub doesn't, um, scroll the, I was hoping you would just scroll the code and not the side panel. So now instead of, uh, so like the UI gets smaller instead of just the font. That's not what I want. Okay. So about 130 lines of code, which is not much. And a lot of it, 17 of them are this copyright statement. Okay. And we're not really importing much config standard IO usual stuff, whatever full right is and long options. And we have a defines for the program names and the authors, David McKenzie. And we have this, whatever. So usage. I guess is going to print out some usage statement. And then here we have finally main on line 58. And this looks like boilerplate initialize main set program name, etc. A T at exit, I guess we're going to call close standard out. This is probably maybe similar to, uh, defer and Golang at exit. I, I'm guessing is some, some custom implemented thing. Um, Parse new standard options only. And so we're, so we're going to parse options. This is like set up. Presumably there's a, a, this set up at exit is essentially teardown, but it's on the top of the function just for, I guess, readability and to make sure that, uh, it happens before anything else happens that could, <laughs> that could break. And then we're, uh, bad cast. So what, what can I do with? Yes. Can I give it my own output? 
you can call help and you can pass the string How about yes potato or yes ants yeah okay so you can pass it a string all right and it says buffer data locally buffer data locally once rather than having the large overhead of standard io buffering each item so we're going to allocate set buff allocate to zero we're going to uh, have this bool operand strings is reuse operand strings is true so we're going to try to reuse operand strings uh, by default and we're going to set operand p which is a card double star to operands is operands passed in yeah so operands is argv plus opt index opt end what is opt end I'm not sure so what if i can i pass multiple things to yes oh, uh, yes i like pie yeah okay so you can pass in multiple um not only is this a single string so that's different from a passing in a string right so passing in like this i guess the parser treats each word as an argument and i think that what they're doing is essentially uh concatenating those arguments into a single string all right um where are we so then we're going to have this do while while plus plus operand p is less than operand limit i guess this is maybe this is printing one word and there's some operand limit on the uh the um the size of stuff you can print at any rate we're going to get the operand length allocate uh some increment buff allocate by the length plus one and then check if operand plus one is less than operand limit so we're going to check if we're beyond the limit and if we are i guess we're going to set reuse operand strings to false so if operand p plus one is less than the limit and operand p plus length plus one is not equal to operand p1 okay so if we're less than the limit, right? Then we're not going to reuse operand strings. And then we're going to increment until we're past the operand limit. And then we're going to improve, improve performance by using a buffer size greater than buff size over two. I don't know how that improves performance, but I guess uh, whatever buff size is, buffs is, this is a constant, right? Because it's all caps. So maybe it's a standard for uh, core utils. So for less than the buff size over two, we're gonna set buff alloc to buff size and reuse operand strings to false. By using a buffer size greater than buff size over two, but do we actually do that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we set it to buff size rather than half buff size. All right. And then we're going to fill the buffer with one copy of the output. If possible, reuse the operand strings. This wins when the buffer would be large. Okay. So uh, we're going to set buff to, depending on whether we're reusing op operand strings, we're going to set it to the operand, or we're going to uh, x malloc buff alloc. Set buff used to zero and set operand p to operands. And then we're going to do th have this other do while loop where we're going to get this, take the string length of the operand stuff and if we're reusing we're going to mem copy buff and buff used um so we're going to i think the way mem copy works is this stuff for this length gets copied into this buffer and then we're going to keep i basically do some um note uh, what's uh, uh, keeping track of of buffers and, and whatnot and um we're going to set uh, a space, I guess, at the end of the buffer. I'm not sure if that space is for, um, like when I typed, I like pie, if that's the space between I and like, I don't think that there's any other space. So I think that's what we're doing. We're doing one thing and, um, it's, uh, it's got spaces between the different operands. And then we add a new line. And if a larger buffer was allocated, fill it by repeating the buffer contents. And then we'll set copy size to buff used. 
and then we're going to iterate over uh, the copies buff alloc over buff over copy size decrement copies and then do this mem copy stuff and then set buff used plus or uh, to will increment buff used by copy size so we're making copies of the um, of the of the thing of the of the stuff that was in the buffer by repeating the, the buffer contents. And then we're gonna repeatedly output this buffer until there's a write error and then fail. <laughs> and then we're gonna so we're gonna write full with uh the stand just standard out and then continue. So this is an infinite loop. And if we get an error, we're gonna call exit failure. So that's straightforward. Where is, uh, let's see if these AI people told me about anything interesting in core details. So they say basic file operations, text processing, including grep. I don't know if grep is in there. Cat, sort, cut, and said. I don't think the said and grep are in core, the core utils repo, but I'm not sure. Certainly said and grep have their own repo. We looked at said before. I don't think we looked at grep. Um, we have shell utils like echo, test. I think these are all things I've seen so far. Yeah. Okay. Not you, Bard. <laughs> so Bard's giving a different answer. It's telling me like at a higher level, like more conceptually, adherence to POSIX standards, extensive documentation, a wide range of features. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, yeah. So um, modulo tracking kind of what's going on to all of the bits at the various uh, parts. This is I think this is, um, it's clear what, what yes is doing. It's, um, there are a few optimizations to make it fast. I think there are probably a lot of ways to implement yes. That is not as performant as, um, the, the GNU implementation. I'm not sure why you need an optimized yes, but it's kind of, uh, mildly interesting, I suppose, mildly amusing. All right, here's cat. So cat is a utility that I use all the time as opposed to yes, which I use rarely. So you're gonna have some file and a descriptor on which input file is open. So you've got some file descriptor and a buffer for line numbers. So we're gonna print a file, right? And so I guess we have some buffer uh, for line numbers. Does it print the line numbers? An 11 digit counter may overflow within an hour on <laughs> a P2 466. An 18 digit counter needs about 1000 years. So how do I get cat to print line numbers? Uh, let's see. Let's cat the readme. So that's the default. Whoops. And cat. Uh, number non empty open output lines. And then n. So cat n. Hmm. Okay. For some reason, I never, I never realized you could do that. Okay. So. We've got some buffer to hold the line numbers and we don't want to overflow if we're on an old ancient computer. Um, the position in line buff, where printing starts. This will not change unless the number of lines is larger than, uh, what is this? Uh, oops, six nines, I think that was. All right, we've got the position of the first digit in line buff position of last digit in line buff. So we're going to keep track of the digits in the buffer. And this is all line buff, I think is the line numbers. Okay. This is all line number support. Let's skip past this. We have a usage function and we have a like a next line number. It's a lot of stuff devoted to making line numbers work. And then here we, here we have simple cat, which returns a bool, plain cat, copy the file behind input description to standard out file number file. No file number, I guess. Buff of size buff size is the IO buffer used by reads and writes return true if successful. Yeah. So we're going to take simple cat's going to take a buffer and a buff size and it will loop until the end of the file. So while true, we're going to read a block of input by calling safe read. I'm not sure what uh, makes it safe, but, um, I guess it's not going to, it's going to do things like make sure it's 
like I'm not sure if it's sanitizing input. It might just be not clobbering memory in some way. And then we're gonna return the, the so safe read returns the, the, I guess, number of lines read, possibly number of characters read. And then we're gonna ch check for errors. If we're at the end of the file, then um, we're gonna return true, which I guess is success. Otherwise, we're gonna write out the block. So we're gonna call full write on standard out. And if it's not equal, so the number of we've written, if it's not equal to the number we've read, then we exit with an error. So that's about as simple as you can get. We have this write pending thing, write ending pending output to standard file no. Pending is defined to be whatever BP out, out buff buffs. Yeah, okay. But when is this called? So this is where I am, about 311. So who calls this? Is this like fancy cat? Static bool cat. Okay, so this is non-simple cat. So non-simple cat, which is just called cat as, a, as opposed to simple cat, is copy the file behind input description to standard out file number, just like simple cat. And then we're gonna use in buff and read in size with each call and out buff and write out size with each call. The buffers are a bit larger than the IO sizes. The remaining Boolean args say what cat options to use. It'll return true if we're successful. So do we call out the simple cat or is it complete re-implementation? So we're gonna keep track of new lines. While true, we're gonna do some stuff. Check output buff, out buff and out size, and that it's smaller than uh, small enough, I guess. Right, if there are at least out size buffers and out buff, then um, we're gonna set WP to out buff. I don't know what WP stands for, but maybe we'll find out. And we'll keep track of the remaining bytes. And then you have this do while loop. We'll try to do a full write with whatever WP is, which is, I guess, like the chunk of stuff that we have to the out size and error if it's not. And then we'll increment WP, maybe like a pointer, a write pointer, um, and we'll compute the remaining bytes. And we do this while out size is less than or equal to the remaining bytes. And then we're gonna move the remaining bytes to the beginning of the buffer. Okay. By calling mem move. Let me check if the input buffer is empty, which is, I guess, the same as being done with printing. And if so, we'll send, um, we'll set, we'll say we're not, there's no input pending. And if we have this thing defined, which I'm not sure what it is, we'll set um, enter read to zero. Check if there's any input to read immediately. If not, we are about to wait. So write all buffered output before waiting. So we're gonna just get rid of all of our stuff and then we're gonna somehow wait. I don't know how we're gonna wait. Uh, maybe there's a sleep call. Maybe there's a um, some sort of yieldy thing. I'm not sure, uh, right pending, et cetera. And we call, and then if we're down here, then we're gonna do another safe read. Check whether we've done reading, et cetera. Whoopsie. I don't know where I was. I think I was. Somewhere around here. And then we're gonna, so somehow they're gonna have a sentinel in the buffer. Um, I'm not sure what the sentinel is for. It was real, not a sentinel new line. I guess it's a, the sentinel is a new line. Why are they using it? I'm not sure. It's keeping track of something, some sort of uh, partial progress, I expect. Um, and then more, uh, kind of like characters. So this is a little bit complicated. I'm not going to dig in um, too much into the actual implementation here because I think this is the sort of thing. Here's copycat. I think this is the sort of thing where um, if your brain if your brain is configured to do this, like you've been programming um, in this style for like a couple of days straight, then um, 
it's really straightforward. And, uh, but at this level of detail, I think this is, this is possibly not worth, um, worth understanding on the, on the first, on the first go round. Cause there's a lot of logic here, a lot of if else, um, and that sort of stuff. Okay. So here's copy cat, copy data from input to output using copy file range if possible. Let me make sure that I, uh, I keep forgetting and I'm trying to re be better at member, but, uh, let me make sure that I update the, uh, the live stream with what we were looking at, which is core utils. <laughs> Looks like a bowl of spaghetti. <laughs> I think it might just be a wizard thing. Yeah, it's kind of, so this is a little bit of an old style. So I, I think I, I've, I've never written C like straight C for a living. I've written C plus plus. And, um, I think that C, the, the style is, is clean, I guess, as far, as far as C goes, it's just, we're working with characters. Like if CH is bigger than or equal to 32, I think this is just the ANSI character, right? Um, and so to, to really understand it, you have to ha just get yourself in the mindset of, um, of C and characters and all that stuff. And I just haven't done that in the, in the recently enough to, um, for it to be informative. So people ask me like all the time, um, about reading code and how to get better at it. And one thing that I do that, that I, I try to flag as I, um, as I decide that, you know, is, uh, is this, is this piece of code like worth, um, understanding more right now, like investing more in, like you're investing, <laughs> you're investing in the stock market or whatever. And, um, and, uh, just being, being comfortable making those sorts of, uh, priority decisions is something that's, that's hard. I think the less, uh, the less experience you have. Um, but, uh, I try to be pretty ruthless about, about prioritizing stuff like that. Okay. All right. So here's, we have main and I'm going to just ignore, I think the rest of cat, but I do think it's interesting that, um, we have the simple cat, which is extremely easy to understand it. And I would guess that that's how a lot of the core utils looked originally back when they were created. Who knows when that was, uh, maybe you can look it up maybe eighties or nineties, 2007, 2002 were created by merging the earlier packages. Okay. So there were earlier packages, text utils, file utils, shell utils. So whatever, whenever those were originally written, I bet a lot of them looked like simple cat. And then over time, um, there's a, just a bunch of performance op optimizations that really matter, um, because they're used everywhere. There's a, uh, a pretty good data, a data book. I think it was, I think it's the, um, like writing data intensive applications or, or something like along those lines. Um, Designing data data intensive applications. This is a pretty good book, um, and I think that this is the book where it it mentions that like they ran this <laughs> they ran the same computation using like um, shell utilities and pipes versus um, I think some well known data big data like search engine thing or whatever, and um, often the the shell utilities perform better on small enough data that can run on a single machine because they are really optimized. Um, and then you, there's overhead involved in trying to make things distributed and whatnot. So there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot to be said about the optimizations that have gone into making things like cat fast. And, you know, if you're just an everyday user, you might not think that <laughs> it makes it's important to have a fast cat, but I think in, um, ultimately is it is. And so that, that's some of what we're seeing. Um, so here's SE Linux he, the, with SE Linux. I'm just kind of curious what they're doing in this file. And it's not long It's 55 lines. We've got this restore con. I don't know what con is, but maybe, um, not connection. I don't know. Restore con. 
by Daniel Walsh. Or not CC. Let's see if there's SC Linux at C. If is reg security compute con condition, maybe, maybe there's some, I don't know. SE Linux con. Maybe it's something like a condition, but I'm not sure. I'm not going to go any further into it. Here's shred for shred. I'm just kind of curious. Where is the. Where is it getting data? Is it just reading from dev random or does it have some more advanced algorithm like overwriting with zeros and then overwriting with random or whatever? Uh, all right. Um, so we're going to take default three passes. I don't know if shred is still useful in the world of SSDs. If you know, let me know. Actually, let's ask uh, Bard. Is new shred still useful? For SSD drives. I'll put you over here, Bard. Can you do this? What? I don't think I could do this. No. no, GNU Shred is not useful for SSD drives. SSD drives use a different method of storing data than traditional hard drives, and Shred is not designed to work with this method. As a result, using Shred on an SSD drive will not effectively erase the data. And then it tells me how to effectively erase uh, an SSD drive. One is to use a built-in secure erase feature. So I guess the device manufacturer knows about the physics of the device and they can uh, design a feature for securely erasing it. It will overwrite all the data on the drive, make it impossible to recover. You can use a third-party utility de designed specifically for SSD drives. And here are some reasons why GNU Shred is not useful. SSD drives use a technique called wear leveling to spread out the wear on the drive's memory cells. Yeah, this means that data is not always stored in the same physical location on the drive. As a result, overwriting data on an SSD drive with shred may not actually overwrite the data on the drive's memory cells. All right, so if you have, um, you know, when you do the overwrite operation, you might be writing it in a different physical location and then the drive somehow remaps that location so that when you request the data, at that identifier, you get the new thing. And so since you've overwritten, you've not overwritten the thing, the old thing was still recoverable, I guess. And then SSD drives have a limited number of writes that they can perform before they start to fail. Using shred on an SSD drive will unnecessarily increase the number of writes that the drive performs. I'm not sure if that's, that matters. I think, I think if you're shredding a, well, maybe if you're shredding individual files, I don't know. Okay. Okay, so what is Shred actually going to do? We've got remove method, non unlink wipe sync, options, force. So these are options, etc. I kind of just want to know where is it getting the data? What was it? Um, default passes. So iterations is going to be set to default passes, and then we're going to get We're going to set the actual flag to whatever these are passed in, but somewhere we're going to read default passes, right? Is that this file? Is it, I mean, uh, this method. So do wipe FD. This looks promising. The core routine to actually do the work. This overrates the first size bytes of the given file descriptor. Return true if successful. So you're going to give it a file descriptor, a Q name, whatever Q name is. A source of random ints. Um, some options, some flags. So random int source is really doing the, uh, is the thing that I want to look at, I guess. Let's see if we can look at it in, um, in, a, in, a, in a minute or two. All right. So uh, allocate some stuff. Um, try to stat the file descriptor and make sure there's no errors. If we know we can't possibly shred the file, give up now. Otherwise, we go go into an infinite loop writing data. So we're going to check what? The stat mode, I guess. We're going to check the results of stats. And if it's 
FIFO? Is it, is CHR or is SOC? I guess like a socket. So I guess you can't like shred a TCP socket. Invalid file type. So let's try to shred something that I don't believe will be shreddable. How about, um, let's shred dev random. It'll try to shred <laughs> dev random. Can we shred, uh, <laughs> this is going to destroy my computer. I have to sudo, which I'm not going to do. Okay. All right. So you can, it'll try to prevent you from shredding certain files, which I think if I'm reading this correctly, includes socket files, whatever CHR is, uh, maybe like a teletype file, like a terminal. You don't want to shred a terminal. All right. Um, you're going to check if something is registered, allocate a pass array. I guess we'll just keep, keep track of the passes. <laughs> now you're going to nuke your system. Yeah, it happens. I'll try it. I'll try it um, when I'm not streaming. I'll try to shred some stuff. All right. Um, checking flags, check if stuff is registered. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Round up to the nearest box size to, to clear stack space. So this is just some, some computation and checking if there's a remainder. Else, the behavior of LSeq is unspecified, but in practice, it returns a positive number, and that's the size of this device. Unspecified. I don't think this is the kind of comment you want in a in something you're relying on for security. At any rate, we're going to get the size of the device, check that it's not negative or zero, and call gen pattern. So gen pattern is going to Take the number of iterations, the pass array in S, where S is what? I don't think S is the source of randomness, right? Oh, it is. It is the source of, it is the random in source. Okay. So it's going to take the, the array that we're going to write into, I guess, the number of iterations and a source of, of essentially entropy, source of random integers. And then we're going to set RS to be random int get source of S. And in a loop, in an infinite loop, while true, we're going to, this is kind of like computation stuff. Where do we actually write? We're going to call do pass down here. So for I, number of iterations plus flag zero fill. I don't know what zero fill is. Maybe after you write it, it will fill optionally fill it with zeros. Um, and we're going to take the, set the type. If I is less than flag number of iterations, then we're going to set the type to the pass array at I, whatever that is, or zero. And then we're going to call do pass and do pass is going to do the work. And then we're going to deallocate data. And then we have other methods like wipe FD, a wrapper with a little more checking. So, so a lot of it's just checking that things work, checking error conditions, and then do pass and um, the random in source, I think, are what I want to know about. So do a pass, do pass number k of n, writing size ep bytes of the given pattern type, to the file descriptor of fd. k and n are passed in only for verbose progress messages. Okay, cool. So what does it get? It gets whatever, some name, size p, the random source which is just called S. We have some defines. Do rewind. We might need to rewind. And then constant fill patterns need only be set out once. So we might have a fill pattern of constants. And here's a while true. Is this where we write? How much to write this time? We've got output size. We're going to call rand read, essentially read random stuff from S. Loop to, loop to entry partial writes. To retry partial writes. Okay, so we're gonna try to write. We might fail partially, or we might write some subset, and then I guess this loop is doing retries. And ultimately, we're calling write on the file descriptor and the pbuff plus soff. And pbuff, I guess, got filled um, by random stuff on rand read. And then the rest is just kind of bookkeeping. Bookkeeping is the word I was looking for <laughs> earlier on the stream. Okay, so where is this uh, randint source?
is it defined in the uh, struct 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 i think these are all function um i think these are just the struct is being passed into the function i'm gonna guess it's from whatever random thing that we're importing rand read maybe rand int i don't know if we have rand int in here that's okay I spell that correctly. And int. Oh, whatever. Let's write Emacs. Where is it? Source. And then I was looking at shred. Oh, it's in Blake. Is that right? What? Rand int dot h. I'm not sure. Is it SRs? Uh, so we have Q, uh, this looks like it. QL lib rand int dot h. Although that doesn't actually look like a definition. Oh, here we go. Oh no, no we don't. Oh, rand int dot c. Random source. I call random all new. There you go. I don't know why I couldn't find it before. All right, a source of random data. And we have a random source has a rand read source, which is the source of the random bytes, and a, um, a number and a max. So what is a rand read source? Oops, I'm gonna xref find. A rand read source is a file. So it's just some some file that can produce random bytes. I guess in practice, it's probably a lot of um, you dev you random. Okay, good enough for now. All right, so that's shred. Shof should be random ordering. Let's see what we got. Reservoir sampling. Return the start of the next line after line. Input size. Read input reservoir sampling. Permuted output reservoir. I don't know what a reservoir is. So we can read the input. We should limit the number amount of data read here it, to less than reservoir min input. Write permuted lines. So how are we going to write permuted lines? We take some number of lines and a permutation. And the, we're going to iterate over the number of lines. We're going to set P to the line. Where's line? Plus the permutation at I. Strings in line must include the line terminator character. So we're going to, I guess, line is a pointer. We're going to increment it by a random amount to get a random, uh, a random line to print. And then we're just going to print it. Then permutation is somehow um, going, to, going to be populated by some random <laughs> random number generation. I'm not sure whether reservoir sampling is a thing that 
is unique to is it, I don't know if it's a statistical method or if it's something about this file. So reservoir sampling is a randomized randomized algorithm that is used to select k out of n samples. n is usually very large or unknown. Okay. Reservoir sampling. It's a family of randomized algorithms for choosing a simple random sample without replacement of k items from a population of unknown size n in a single pass over the items. Uh, the size of population n is not known to the algorithm is typically too large for all n items to fit into memory. Okay, so how does it work? Initialize an array r indexed from 1 to k. So we're choosing what k is the number of items we're choosing. Okay, this is the reservoir. For each new input x sub i, containing the first k items of the input. So we're just going to take the first k. And then for each new input, generate a random number j uniformly from 1 to i. And if j is in 1 to k, then um, we're going to set r, which is defined here. We're going to set the jth index of r to be xi. Otherwise, we're going to discard xi. Then we're going to return r after all inputs are processed. All right. Okay, so that that's they're going to do something like that in shuffle. So we're not going to look too much at it. Sleep, I guess, is probably pretty simple. They have to call out, I guess, likely to the kernel. We've got this at exit thing. We're going to parse options. We just get main right away. So that's a good. That's a good sign that we're in uh, land of simplicity. Um, and whatever opt in is, we're going to iterate over the options essentially. And whatever x string to decimal, I guess we're going to take the some string, turn it into a number, and possibly error out. We're trying to compute seconds. If we're not okay, we're going to exit, and then we're going to call it x nano sleep, and we're including x nano sleep here. Where is x nano sleep defined? I don't know. See if we can just find it on the internet. Yeah, it's Linux. So we're, we're calling, essentially, it seems like we're calling nano sleep. And then maybe the X is the thing that is like X malloc in the sense that it fails. Um, if, the, you know, it dies if it doesn't work. I'm not sure. Sort. Here, I'm just kind of curious what sort algorithm we're using. Merge, max merge, maximum number of lines to merge every time a node is taken from the, mer the merge queue. Node is at level in the binary merge tree and is responsible for emerging total lines. We have a heuristic value for the number of lines for which it is worth creating a subthread during an internal merge sort. Okay, so we've, we've got at least merge sorts in the mix here. And sometimes, uh, heuristically, we might decide to do um, the merge sort in a separate thread, a subthread, i.e. it is a small number of average lines for which sorting via two threads is faster than sorting via one on an average system. Okay. I'm curious for this sort of stuff, like let's say that you are um, a company that runs a cloud like Google or, or Amazon or Microsoft, and you're using this sort function. I wonder if you tune these like heuristics so that um, they perform optimally on your, on your system. Or is everyone just using the the standard the standard heuristic that we saw somewhere? I forget where it was, but um, it was like this heuristic works well on some computer that was <laughs> released in the 1980s. So I don't know how often stuff like that gets revisited. There's not unless somebody's like reading the code. That stuff I don't think is really surfaced anywhere in like the documentation necessarily. Okay, so um, we've got merge sort. Do we have quick sort? Merge. Is it all merge sort all the way down? We have pipe fork, fork a child process for piping to and do common cleanup. Move file descriptor, some closed stuff for file to stream open. I'm going to guess that it is just all merge sort. Uh, and then, oh, wait, maybe I should search for Q sort. 
We do have Q sort. But what function is this part of? Init tables. So initialize the character class tables. I guess this is like if you're playing D&D &D and you have the character class and you want to sort them. No, I don't know what character class tables are, but we can init tables. And as part of init tables, we might call Q sort. Is that the only occurrence of Q sort? Yeah. Do you have a header? No. Let's ask uh, Bard. What algorithm does GNU core utils sort function use? You think about that, Bard, and I'll move on. All right, stat is for getting information about the file system. I don't know if it stands for statistics or state or what, I don't know, BOS support. I don't know if BOS is still around. Okay, we have things like this is already pretty big, about 2,000 lines of code. So there's a lot going on here. Most of it, I suspect, should be really done by the operating system. And then I suppose that um, GNU is going to provide a common interface. Uh, by operating system, I, I really mean the kernel. So um, I guess GNU is going to provide, provide a common interface over all the possible things that a, that a kernel could do. And I guess if you have like POSIX, that should be a relatively limited set. So you just do stat. We're gonna get the file descriptor, whatever Strack is. And we have the stat struct. If we're at FDCWD, something, something working directory, I don't know. We might follow links, or I guess we might not follow links. We might have different sync behaviors. And we're calling stat X. And I'm going to guess that um, stat x might be the actual important thing, stat x.h. Do we have stat x.h here? We do. Stat conversion functions for core utils. We have stat x to stat. And this has things like, okay, so like converting the stacks, the SDX UID to the one expected by stat and stuff along those lines. But what else do we do? If we have stat X, let's see if we can find stat X. Fire suppression systems. So stat X is a Linux thingy. Get the file status. It's a system call. Okay. So yeah, ultimately we're making a system call with stat X and we've got some utilities for translating the results of stat X to, to what GNU wants. And then I have a feeling the rest of this file is just, first of all, we've lost highlighting, but I have a feeling the rest of this file is just um, kind of marshalling things into and out of formatting and that the real the really interesting part is going to happen in the kernel. And so I'm just going to move on here. Although I'll check in on Bard. So the GNU core utils sort function uses a hybrid algorithm called intro sort. It's a combination of quick sort, heap sort, and insertion sort. Quick sort is divide and conquer. Yeah, that's known for its efficiency. It works by recursive partitioning, et cetera, et cetera. Heap sort is a heap based algorithm known for simplicity and stability. And insertion sort is a simple insertion sort. It works on efficiency on small arrays. So it uses quick sort as the default algorithm, but switches to heap sort or insertion sort if quick sort is not performing well. It makes intro sort, this makes intro sort a very robust and efficient sorting algorithm. Okay, so it's like a, um, this is really common, I think in most sorts that you use, most modern sorts that you use, it should be, at the very least, for things like quick sort, you eventually fall back on something like insertion sort once the things you're sorting get small enough. And it seems like, it sounds like, at least according to Bard, 
who might be hallucinating that um, the core util search is doing that plus somehow heap sort is in the mix and it's got some heuristics for for deciding um, how how well things are going and switching between them. Just for fun, let's see if uh, ChatGPT gives me the same answer. So ChatGPT says it's quick sort. Uh, I'll ask ChatGPT, what is, what's it called? Intro sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who uses intro sort? It's used in the standard library. It lib, uh, okay. And then the last question I'll ask is does, does core utils use intro sort? No, it does not use intro sort. All right, well, what's right? I'm going to guess that um, ChatGPT is right and that uh, the sort file we were looking at is really some version of quick sort. Um, and the merge stuff wasn't that, that it was talking about wasn't merge sort. It was just doing the merge part of the of quick sort. Okay, here's sync update the super block. I'm not so sure this is interesting. Let's ignore sync system, system dependent definitions for core utils. This is not so interesting, I guarantee. Um, LS, I thought might be interesting, but there's nothing here. <laughs> it's going to call it has X. Oh, this is the header. Maybe there's something interesting in the implementation. Okay. We've got 5,647 lines of code. So there's a lot going on here. And some of it's going to be um, uh, things like color, which is um, maybe not so important. Like if your goal is to understand what Unix is up to, all of that code is kind of a distraction from, um, from the from the heart, the heart of what's really going on. We include a bunch of stuff. Obstack, quote smack. I guess ls does need smack because you're not supposed to list. Uh, ls shouldn't output smart files, for example, that you don't have access to. A uh, bunch of stuff for allocating. Unix-based re-adder implementations have historically returned a durant.d ino value that is sometimes not equal to the stat obtained st in ino value for the same entry. So kind of some workaround um, for implementations. Quoting, like quote name, loop detect. I guess we might need to detect if we're in a loop. A hash table of active directories. The set of active directories from the current command line argument to the level in the hierarchy at which files are being listed. The directory is represented by its device and inode numbers. A directory is added to the set when ls begins listing it or its entries and is removed from the set just after it has finished. What is R? Is R recursive? Let's do man ls. All, almost all. Uh, Dured. Dereference, literal. Quoting snap, reverse and recursive. I did not know that you could do it recursively. So let's try LSR man. So is this just, let's see. Let's try Etsy. Oops, capital R, right? And it won't let me. Okay, so it produces this kind of output where you get a list of the directory. And then in that list, you get kind of this table of, um, 
of output, which is different, a uh, table of, of files in the directory, which is different from like the output of tree, right? I think, yeah, so tree gives you like this visual tree information. Okay, so a lot of this is going to be for, um, for options that I don't use and are possibly mildly interesting, but I think once you understand how to write in LS, you would probably understand how to add like tabular format like that. So um, I'm gonna guess that there's not a whole lot here. I guess I'll just quickly peek through. We have stat, we're getting calls to stat X. There's probably um, several more. Yeah, so you're gonna have to enumerate all the things in a directory and, and essentially stat them and then marshal the um, um sorry hang on here my phone is on do not disturb but i'm still getting beeps um so you're gonna have to enumerate everything in the directory and call stat essentially on, on each of them so let's see if that's what it's doing where does this function begin or are these all different functions? Uh, Jared indent, dev into, <laughs> dev I know push, dev I know pop, where's main? Here's main. So we're gonna initialize, et cetera, exit. Um, do some color stuff. Check whether we're recursive. I guess I'll ignore recursive. Allocate some stuff using TZ allocate. Is that time zone? And format needs stat. It's going to be equal to this. Um, we're going to compute some sort of thing over or with ORs with about sort time, sort size, format, and stuff like that. I'm going to ignore directory mode, allocate some stuff, check if, the, if there are fewer than zero files. If there are, there's an, some sort of error, presumably. Oops. Oh, Lordy. I don't know what I clicked on. Okay. And then, so if there are fewer than zero files, then we look at the immediate directories and we gobble a file. We gobble file dot, which is the current directory, right? and, or we queue the directory dot. And then we, I guess we might gobble some more files that you pass into argv. CWD and used. Oh, CWD must be changed working directory. Um, so if whatever this Boolean is, is set, then we're gonna sort the files and possibly extract directories from files and uh, more stuff with if is used. And then while we have pending directories, this is the loop I was looking for, we're gonna get set this pen to the pending directories, um, set pending directories to the pending directories next. So we're gonna get the next one so that we can do it, I guess the next iteration of the loop. And then if loop detect, so some loop condition, I guess has been factored out into loop detect. And then we get the, we check the name, make sure it's not the null pointer of the current directory. And we're going to pop an I know, remove it from the active set, and check for some error. Affirm, I guess, that it was found, freeze some stuff. Oh, sorry, this is if it's a null pointer, then we do some error handling. Sorry, I thought this is if not a null pointer for a second. Otherwise, we're going to print the directory, free pending end, and print dir name is sits true. And if we're printing with color, then we'll do some more colory stuff. If we're in directory, you might do the, the directory stuff, et cetera. So I think really print directory is what's handling the the, the printing. Is that right? Where did print directory go? Print dir. Read directory name and list the files in it. Yeah, this is the real, um, seems like the real thing. So. It's gonna read the directory name and list the files. 
and it's got this loop detect stuff. Okay, so that's ls. It does basically what we expect it to do. Here's ls.c, which I already opened up. Make directory, um, I think it really ultimately has to, um, there will be some um, massaging of things around, I guess, to possibly get stuff into the right format for the kernel call um, and uh, user, <laughs> username. So just a JQ, not jQuery source code. So JQ is the um, the JavaScript Swiss Army Knife utility thing. I don't know what it's officially called. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll add that. Uh, I'll add that somewhere. Cool. Let's do that. Whoa now, whoa now. All right, so what are we doing? Make directory? Yeah, so I'm thinking make directory is really just gonna be a kernel call. And then um, a bunch of stuff to um, to handle possibly differences between different implementations of, of Unix. And we might have to check if Smack is enabled. Um, or SE Linux that might prevent us from, you know, if you're on a military computer and try to <laughs> make a directory in the super top secret folder, uh, I guess make dir might prevent you from doing that. But I think that's about all we're gonna see out, out of make dir. Make FIFO, make FIFO is named pipes. I don't even know what that is. We're already getting a bit long, so I'm gonna ignore it. Make Knot, I'm gonna guess is even more um, like down in kernel land. Make temp is sometimes useful. This is just going to make a temporary directory. It's got some template, which is a bunch of X's. And then see if I can just man make temp. Create a directory, not a file. So if I do make temp foo. I figured out how to call it. Let's find an example. A complete tutorial for make ten. <laughs> All right. Oh, it didn't like that I gave it a name. Make ten. Okay. So I'm just supposed to call it with no name. All right. That's a good temp. That's a real temporary directory. Very good. So it's got some template, and it's going to give you some options for how to populate it. But that's really all it's doing, right? It's basically a templating function. Maybe close standard out. And this is options parsing, and then where's main? Main is, we've got a while loop. Oh, the options parsing is in main, where I think before it was handled separately with some factored out function. And this is really just all like checking options, it looks like. At this point, template is malloced and suffix points into template. And then ultimately, we're just going to call make directory with the template. Create directory, if create directory and some stuff. All right, good enough for me. Move, this really has to ultimately call the Linux kernel, right? Um, copy option in it. There is some stuff, um, do move. I do occasionally use like, like 99.99999% of the time I call copy or move. I call it with no flags, but Occasionally, I do use some of the rarer features, and some of those might be a little bit interesting, but I'm not sure they're interesting enough for us to, to really dig in here. Interactive. So you can ask it to always ask you for things. What is this is move, but not copyright. Um, I mean, let's see. You want it to not, one thing you want move to do is like, let's say you're copying something really important, like your. Um, you wrote your autobiography and it's your only copy and you want to move it from one hard drive to another and the hard drive you're copying it, you're moving it to fails. Um, you want that not to destroy all of your data. So there should be some sort of error handling here. Um, I don't know if we can 
find it. Maybe exit, maybe parcel. If exit failure, failed to get attributes, that's not so interesting. Okay, is this main? Here's do move, yeah, okay. Move source into destination, aka dest, derf, d, and dest real name, handle cross file system moves. If source is a directory, dest must not exist, return true if successful. So, um, if copy into self, in general, when copy returns with copy into self set, source is the same as or apparent of destination. In this case, we know it's apparent. It doesn't make sense to move a directory into itself, and besides, in some situations, doing so would give highly non-intuitive results. Run this, make dir b, touch ac, move uh, star b in an empty directory. Here's the result of running echo, find b print. We have b, b over a, b slash a, b slash b, b slash b slash a, b slash c. Notice that only file a was copied into b slash b. Handle this by giving a diagnostic, removing the copied into self directory, etc. Okay, so you don't wanna let uh, move a directory into itself. We're gonna use a temp directory, I guess we might as well use this one. I cannot move A to a subdirectory of itself. Okay. Uh, else if rename exceeded, succeeded, zero to rename is hit to the null pointer. Else this means that source and destination refer to different devices. It may also conceivably mean that even though they are referred to the same device, rename wasn't implemented for that device. Okay, so you might move between devices. Yeah. But what's actually being moved? Oh, sorry. Copy is, <laughs> this is just checking the okay status. All right. So copy is really what's being called. Okay. And then, um, if copy fails, then copying failed. And then we don't delete the stuff, right? Directory to remove is set to null pointer in this case. Otherwise, if we're here, uh, then the directory to remove is set to the source, and then we're going to delete it, right? So the directory to remove is not the null pointer. So we successfully copied, and we don't have any of this other weird stuff going on that's preventing us from removing the directory. Then ultimately, where's directory to remove? Let's highlight directory to remove. Then dir zero is, is equal to dir to remove, and dir one is equal to null pointer. And then we're going to call remove, which probably ultimately gives you a system call on the thing that we that that, that we set from the directory. Okay, so that makes sense. So the reason that when you move a, a folder from one device to another, if that fails, the reason that you don't lose your data is that first we're doing copy, and if copy fails, then we don't remove the original directory, as, as you would expect. All right, no hop is a command immune to hangups with output to a non-TTY. I'm mildly curious about this, but I think I'm just gonna skip it. Sorry any, if there are any no hop fans. I'm gonna skip nproc too. Paste is gonna merge lines of files. I'm not sure I wanna do this. Printf, we wanna see printf. I'll ignore remove. I think that's gonna be similar to move. I'll ignore T, but let's look at the description of T. Read from standard input and write to standard output and files. This should be just, you read some stuff, you have a buffer in the middle, and then you have a <laughs> buffer that's the sync, and you um, massage the data through, like throughout. I think that's basically gonna be the implementation. Here's tail. Is there anything interesting about tail? We can check if something is a tailable file in sockets or not, I guess. Oh, no, sockets are. We've got some file spec struct. And then main. 
uh, we've got some number, I guess you can specify the number of sleeps between iterations. Like if you're tailing a log file, like tail F, you, I guess, sleep, you sleep <laughs> between trying to read the, the end, um, initialize some stuff, set program name, set the at exit stuff. Other account lines forever. I guess F is maybe forever. Line end is uh, set to a new line character. Some prior options. To start printing with item and units. Whoops. Why does it keep happening? All right. Um, if from start up, blah, blah, blah. What is Streck? String equal? Yeah, Streck must be string equal. You might find a hyphen. Is this parsing? It seems like parsing. If forever and ignore FIFO, et cetera, pipes, then we're going to call stat on the out stat thing. No, sorry, we're going to allocate out stat, says struct. And we're going to try to stat the output, I suppose. Where do we actually read? Tail forever, I think, is ultimately called. Hello there, Jefferson McGee. <laughs> How do we move this? Thanks. I'm glad that, um, so Jefferson McGee says that they, they recently started um, learning C and it's been great fun and my streams have been helpful. I am glad that they have been helpful. I'm curious what, um, what people are working on, if anyone's working on anything interesting these days. Test is the GNU test program. And I don't think I want to continue looking at this. I was originally wanted to do about an hour, about an hour and a half. So now I'm just kind of plowing through. TR filter and translate is um, something that I, whenever I run across, um, often when I want to do something hard <laughs> in the shell, um, TR is one of the things that, that comes up that I feel like I should probably know better, but. I, I don't. So uptime, I'm going to guess is somehow it has to get it from the kernel, right? Uptime. We've got number of users. Display the system uptime and the number of users on the system. We're going to call it read UTMP. What is read UTMP? Oh, is this universal time something or other? Our files that keep track of logins and logs outs. Yeah, so it was, maybe it's just ultimately reading um, some file. System boot time used by uptime. So it's just reading a file and printing it out with some stuff going on. Who am I is probably doing something similar. So how, where is it getting who I, it's just going to get, get the user ID, um, and then get the P W U I D from the UID. It's going to give you the P W, which I don't think stands for password, but we'll look it up. P W U I D. And then we're going to get the P W name from P W. So it's, the interesting stuff is really being done by get EUID and get PWID. Password file entry. Okay, so it's looking in the password file. So it's it's essentially looking in the, um, what's the other file? I guess it's getting the user ID, yeah, from wherever, wherever that lives. And then um, it's looking that up essentially in the password file, it seems like, conceptually at least. The current process is effective user ID. Yeah. Okay, so we just need this get effective user ID in order to know, you're asking who am I? So that, that answers the I, who's running this, who's running this um, shell thingy. DU is a utility that I use um, pretty frequently to, to like recursively print out um, what directories are using space on a disk. And um, especially now that we've seen other files implemented, 
we have a, I think we have a good sense of what what this is going to look like. It's going to um, uh, start with with the the current directory. It's going to recursively enumerate all the contained directories and there are probably configurations for like whether to follow sim links or not follow sim links. And then it's going to call into the kernel um, probably some version of stat and uh, get file size information. And then it's going to sum those up and print them in a table. And in fact, I'm so certain that that's basically the implementation that I'm not going to look at it at all. Um, copy is, again, I think um, it's mainly going to be about ultimately making the the system call to move, relocate stuff on the disk. And then a lot of the other effort is going to be getting options working and that sort of thing is, is what I'm gonna guess. But let's take a quick look at copy. Make directory parents private. We've got mem copy from the desk to Succeed immediately if the parents of constur must already exist. Okay, so that's the directory. Let's find main. So far, looking at main has been a pretty effective strategy. Okay, option parsing. My preference would be that um, if possible, the option parsing would be somewhere else. So like setting X update to, to true based on the option It'd be nice if this could be like factored out and then somehow um, main could could call that function so that you don't you don't have to like scroll past all the option parsey stuff. All right, checking if stuff is recursive, et cetera. Hash init allocate space for remembering copy and repeated files. And then ultimately we're calling do copy. So scan the arguments and copy each by calling copy. Return true if, success, is if successful. So we've got stat stuff, it looks like, st. Do we have an x function, an x system call? Seems to be their style. Let's see, where are we? 625? Let's just search for the letter x. What'd you say? Well, we, we get a call to copy, which is different from do copy. And we're getting copy from include copy.h, which may not be here. But it is. So copying is actually done with this file. And it's got this uh, ref link stuff, which I think is closer to the system call. So stuff about hard links. Etc. What about copy.c? What is going on here? <laughs> there you go. So copy.c. Is going to be the implementation. Is there anything interesting here? Follow ft stat at. Act like f stat, except in following symbolic links on Solaris type systems. Punch hole. Attempt to punch a hole to avoid any permanent speculative preallocation on file systems such as, F, such as XFS. Huh. Create hole. Create a hole at the end of a file to avoid preallocation if requested. Huh. Okay, so let's see what the Linux system. I don't know if if copying is a primitive, um, is a primitive thing. I think it might be about linking and unlinking or something. Let's look for a link. Force link. Follow sim links. We've got hard link, et cetera. Let's ask Bard. Who's Bard? Let's 
So I don't think there's one that lets you copy files, but I think that there's going to be one that lets you like write files. I'm just curious to see how it answers. Copy file range is a relatively new system call. Okay. So just read and write. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So there's just reading and writing and, uh, or there used to be, and ultimately that's what, um, copy is going to do. So I guess it is up to copy and CP to make sure that, um, Things like error handling is probably pretty interesting. Print F could be mildly interesting, but this is so, okay. So I'm gonna close out copy, print F. I think I'm just gonna close out. And um, the reason is that the interesting part of, the uninteresting part of print F is that it's going to print some stuff uh, by writing to like standard out or whatever. The interesting part is all of the, all of the formatting, which, is there's just so much of it and so many like possible edge cases that I'm not sure it's really worth going into. Although there's not a lot, maybe it's only 725 lines. So we'll, we'll quickly scroll through it, I guess. So here's main, we're checking arguments and we're gonna call print formatted. So where's print formatted? Print the text in format using argv with argc elements for arguments to any percent directives. So maybe it's not so bad. So you have the percent directives and is that the only thing? So it's essentially a template and then you populate the template. If F equals format, and you're gonna switch on F. Oh, so we just have the case analysis on the uh, thing. And we, if we have a percent, then we have, um, uh, what is F? Okay. So if we have um, a percent, the next thing I guess might be a percent, in which case we have a literal percent, or it might be a B, like percent B, in which case we're going to call print escape string with arg V, if arg C is bigger than zero. I'm not sure that that's, what is B? Shouldn't B be binary? Maybe that's what this is. Uh, percent, let's look at the printf. See if there's a table. So where's lowercase b? Is that, hmm. Percent, how about printf formats? Is B Boolean? Where's B? Here's G. I don't see, um, U O X F E G capital G A. Yeah. I don't know what B is. Am I reading this function wrong? At any rate, what's, all right, so Q, quote arg style, et cetera. Um, and then we, so we go into this, what it is, Q. This, I'm not sure what this is doing. Okay, A, <laughs> I'm not sure. Is Q one of my our options?
let's try the uh try barn i guess So, okay, so B is used to print Boolean value of the string. I'm not sure why that wasn't showing up in the um, in the tables. Is used for a quoted string. So, uh, so Q so printing hello world with QN it will print quoted hello world. Okay. Is a portable format specifier. All right. So yeah, so that's what the that's what this if is. I just wanted to double check that I was what I was reading is what I thought I was reading. I don't know I still don't know what all these OKs are. Maybe they say that these are things that are okay to follow after. Um, but essentially it's a big switch statement, and then inside the switch statement there are if statements. And inside the if statements, there might be more switch statements or for statements, et cetera. And so that's how it works. It seems like the sort of thing you could probably, like if you have a spec, you could probably um, implement this in C at the relative beginning, I think, of your, of your C journey. All right, here's cut, which um, is gonna remove uh, parts of lines of file, files which I think I'm just going to ignore and see if there's anything more interesting. Change root? I don't know. Is there anything interesting here? I feel like ultimately uh, this has to be done. The interesting part has to be done with a system call again. So initialize, get options, switch C, which is one of the options. And we're looking at some case analysis for groups. Oh, no, sorry, the groups is one of the cases that C might be. Uh, this is just more argument parsing. So we're going to check if the new root is the same as the old root. We're getting the new root from the argument from the options. And if it's not the old root, we have to look up users and groups twice. First, outside the CH root to load potentially necessary password group parsing plugins. Okay, so we have to, um, I guess we're not in the, the, the um, CH root uh, thing yet. So we still have access to the outside password group stuff. And second, inside the CH root to redo parsing in case IDs are different. So when we change, so CH root is just changing the root. So it's gonna like um, make, your, uh, make your machine think that uh, a new directory is the root directory. And so when you do that, like if you, um, uh, you know, so when you do that, the configuration of the new root and the old root might be different. And among other things, you might have different user IDs or usernames for a user ID and whatnot. And so that's what it's saying. First, we have to look up in the real kind of ambient system and then once inside the system. And yeah. And then ultimately, I, I feel like we call so attempt to set all three simple binary groups, group IDs, user ID, diagnose any failures. If no grid, no GID is supplied or looked up, do so now. Um, get groups, etc. Okay. And then ultimately, we're going to call some function that's actually going to 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 change things, right? UID set, UID set, error number. I don't know. I don't know what that function is. Set groups. Not sure. Let me check something. Oh, oh, I should. So you know what? I have to go. Let me finish. Um, let me just take a couple a look at these, and then I have to head out. Change mod. Uh, we're gonna ignore, and core and paste. We'll ignore. All right. So that's it. Um, sorry to have to run out, but, um, that was core utils. That was pretty interesting. 
Um, I hope you had fun. I um, posted recently a couple of videos about trying to get Haskell to work in the kind of Google-based um, microservices ecosystem with things like Basil and gRPC. Uh, I'm going to post the last of those videos um, early next week. And then once those are up, I'll be able to start doing more, um, more live coding and building of stuff. So that's all for me. Have a good weekend. Thanks for watching.